Chapter One of the Art of War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Art of War by Sun Tzu, translated by Lionel Giles. Chapter One. Laying plans. Sun Tzu said the art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence it is a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. The art of war, then, is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are one the moral law two heaven three earth four the commander five method and discipline the moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him regardless of their lives undismayed by any danger heaven signifies night and day cold and heat times and seasons Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army and its proper subdivisions, the graduations of rank among the officers the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Therefore, in your deliberations when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of a comparison in this wise. 1. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law? 2. Which of the two generals has most ability? 3. With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? 4. On which side is discipline more rigorously enforced? 5. Which army is stronger? 6. On which side are officers and men more highly trained? 7. In which army is there the greater constancy both in reward and punishment? By means of these seven considerations I can forecast victory or defeat. The general that hearkens to my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such a one be retained in command. The general that hearkens not to my counsel nor acts upon it will suffer defeat let such a one be dismissed. While heeding the profit of my counsel, avail yourself also of any helpful circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rules. According as circumstances are favorable, one should modify one's plans. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable, when using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Hold out baits to entice the enemy, feign disorder, and crush him. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. If your opponent is of choleric temper, Seek to irritate him, pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared, appear where you are not expected. These military devices, leading to victory, must not be divulged beforehand. Now the general who wins a battle, makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. The general who loses a battle makes but few calculations beforehand. 
Thus do many calculations lead to victory, and few calculations to defeat. How much more, no calculation at all. It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, translated by Lionel Giles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Waging War. Sun Tzu says, In the operations of war, where there are in the field a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand mail clad soldiers, with provisions enough to carry them a thousand li, the expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests, small items such as glue and paint, and sums spent on chariots and armor, will reach the total of a thousand ounces of silver per day, such is the cost of raising an army of one hundred thousand men. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, then men's weapons will grow dull and their ardor will be damped. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. Now, when your weapons are dulled, your ardor damped, your strength exhausted, and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been seen associated with long delays. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Bring war material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus the army will have food enough for its needs. Poverty of the state exchequer causes an army to be maintained by contributions from a distance. Contributing to maintain an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up, and high prices cause the people's substance to be drained away. When their substance is drained away, the peasantry will be afflicted by heavy exactions. With this loss of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare and three-tenths of their income will be dissipated, while government expenses for broken chariots, worn-out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantles, draft oxen and heavy wagons, will amount to four-tenths of its total revenue. Hence a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own, and likewise a single picul of his provender is equivalent to twenty from one's own store. Now, in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there may be advantage from defeating the enemy, they must have their rewards. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. Thus it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbiter of the people's fate, the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or in peril. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Attack by Stratagem. Sun Tzu said, In the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So, too, it is better to recapture an army entire than to destroy it, to capture a regiment, a detachment, or a company entire than to destroy them. Hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Thus the highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the injunction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field, and the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The preparation of mantlets, movable shelters, and various implements of war will take up three whole months, and the piling up of mounds over against the wall will take three months more. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants, with the result that one-third of his men are slain while the town still remains untaken. Such are the disastrous effects of a siege. Therefore the skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. With his forces intact, he will dispute the mastery of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. It is the rule in war, if our forces are ten to the enemy's one, to surround him, if five to one, to attack him, if twice as numerous, to divide our army into two. If equally matched, we can offer battle, if slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy, if quite unequal in every way, we can flee from him. Hence, though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end it must be captured by the larger force. Now the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. There are three ways in which a ruler can bring misfortune upon his army. One, by commanding the army to advance or to retreat, being ignorant of the fact that it cannot obey. This is called hobbling the army. Two, by attempting to govern an army in the same way as he administers a kingdom, being ignorant of the conditions which obtain in an army. This causes restlessness in the soldiers' minds. Three, by employing the officers of his army without discrimination, through ignorance of the military principle of adaptation to circumstances. This shakes the confidence of the soldiers. But when the army is restless and distrustful, trouble is sure to come from the other feudal princes. This is simply bringing anarchy into the army and flinging victory away. Thus we may know that there are five essentials for victory. One, he will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. Two, he will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. Three, he will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. Four, he will win who, prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. Five, he will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the sovereign. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. End of chapter 3
of the art of war by sun tzu translated by lionel giles this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 4 tactical dispositions sun tzu said the good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy to secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself thus the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat but cannot make certain of defeating the enemy hence the saying one may know how to conquer without being able to do it security against defeat implies defensive tactics ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive standing on the defensive indicates insufficient strength attacking a superabundance of strength the general who is skilled in defense hides in the most secret recesses of the earth he who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven thus on the one hand we have the ability to protect ourselves on the other a victory that is complete to see victory only when it is within the ken of the common herd is not the acme of excellence neither is it the acme of excellence if you fight and conquer and the whole empire says well done to lift an autumn hair is no sign of great strength to see the sun and moon is no sign of sharp sight to hear the noise of thunder is no sign of a quick ear what the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins but excels in winning with ease hence his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage he wins his battles by making no mistakes making no mistakes is what establishes the certainty of victory for it means conquering an enemy that is already defeated hence the skillful fighter puts himself into a position which makes defeat impossible and does not miss the moment for defeating the enemy thus it is that in war the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory the consummate leader cultivates the moral law and strictly adheres to method and discipline thus it is in his power to control success in respect of military method we have firstly measurement secondly estimation of quantity thirdly calculation fourthly balancing of chances fifthly victory measurement owes its existence to earth estimation of quantity to measurement calculation to estimation of quantity balancing of chances to calculation and victory to balancing of chances a victorious army opposed to a routed one is as a pound's weight placed in the scale against a single grain the onrush of a conquering force is like the bursting of pent-up waters into a chasm a thousand fathoms deep end of chapter four chapter five of the art of war by sun tzu translated by lionel giles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Energy Sun Tzu said, The control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up their numbers. Fighting with a large army under your command is no wise different from fighting with a small one. It is merely a question of instituting signs and signals. To ensure that your whole host may withstand the brunt of the enemy's attack and remain unshaken, this is effected by maneuvers direct and indirect. That the impact of your army may be like a grindstone dashed against an egg, this is effected by the science of weak points and strong. In all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle 
but indirect methods will be needed in order to secure victory. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth, unending as the flow of rivers and streams. Like the sun and moon, they end but to begin anew. Like the four seasons, they pass away to return once more. There are not more than five musical notes, yet the combination of these five give rise to more melodies than can ever be heard. There are not more than five primary colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and black, yet in combination they produce more hues than can ever be seen. There are not more than five cardinal tastes, sour, acrid, salt, sweet, bitter, yet combinations of them yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. In battle there are not more than two methods of attack, the direct and the indirect, yet these two in combination give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. The direct and the indirect lead on to each other in turn. It is like moving in a circle. You never come to an end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? The onset of troops is like the rush of a torrent which will even roll stones along in its course. The quality of decision is like the well-timed swoop of a falcon which enables it to strike and destroy its victim. Therefore the good fighter will be terrible in his onset and prompt in his decision. Energy may be likened to the bending of a crossbow, decision to the releasing of a trigger. Amid the turmoil and tumult of battle, there may be seeming disorder and yet no real disorder at all. Amid confusion and chaos, your array may be without head or tail, yet it will be proof against defeat. Simulated disorder postulates perfect discipline. Simulated fear postulates courage. Simulated weakness postulates strength. Hiding order beneath the cloak of disorder is simply a question of subdivision. Concealing courage under a show of timidity presupposes a fund of latent energy. Masking strength with weakness is to be affected by tactical dispositions. Thus one who is skillful at keeping the enemy on the move maintains deceitful appearances according to which the enemy will act. He sacrifices something that the enemy may snatch at it. By holding out baits he keeps him on the march, then with a body of picked men he lies in wait for him. The clever combatant looks to the effect of combined energy and does not require too much from individuals. Hence his ability to pick out the right men and utilize combined energy. When he utilizes combined energy, his fighting men become, as it were, like unto rolling logs or stones, for it is the nature of a log or stone to remain motionless on level ground and to move when on a slope, if four-cornered to come to a standstill, but if round-shaped to go rolling down. Thus the energy developed by good fighting men is as the momentum of a round stone rolled down a mountain thousands of feet in height. So much on the subject of energy. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Weak Points and Strong Sun Tzu said, Whoever is first in the field and awaits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten to battle will arrive exhausted. Therefore the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. By holding out advantages to him, he can cause the enemy to approach of his own accord, or by inflicting damage he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. If the enemy is taking his ease, he can harass him. If he is well supplied with food, he can starve him out. 
If quietly encamped, he can force him to move. Appear at points which the enemy must hasten to defend. March swiftly to places where you are not expected. An army may march great distances without distress if it marches through country where the enemy is not. You can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. You can ensure the safety of your defense if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked. Hence that general is skillful in attack whose opponent does not know what to defend, and he is skillful in defense whose opponent does not know what to attack. O oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy! Through you we learn to be invisible, through you inaudible, and hence we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands. You may advance and be absolutely irresistible if you make for the enemy's weak points. You may retire and be safe from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy. If we wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement even though he be sheltered behind a high rampart and a deep ditch. All we need do is attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve. If we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us even though the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground. All we need do is to throw something odd and unaccountable in his way. By discovering the enemy's dispositions and remaining invisible ourselves, we can keep our forces concentrated while the enemy's must be divided. We can form a single united body, while the enemy must split up into fractions. Hence there will be a whole pitted against several parts of a whole, which means that we shall be many to the enemy's few. And if we are able thus to attack an inferior force with a superior one, our opponents will be in dire straits. The spot where we intend to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points and his forces being thus distributed in many directions, the numbers we shall have to face at any given point will be proportionately few. For should the enemy strengthen his van, he will weaken his rear. Should he strengthen his rear, he will weaken his van. Should he strengthen his left, he will weaken his right. Should he strengthen his right, he will weaken his left. If he sends reinforcements everywhere, he will everywhere be weak. Numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks. Numerical strength from compelling our adversary to make these preparations against us. Knowing the place and the time of the coming battle, we may concentrate from the greatest distances in order to fight. But if neither time nor place be known, then the left wing will be impotent to succor the right the right equally impotent to succor the left, the van unable to relieve the rear, or the rear to support the van. How much more so if the furthest portions of the army are anything under a hundred li apart, and even the nearest are separated by several li? Though, according to my estimate, the soldiers of Huey exceed our own in number, that shall advantage them nothing in the matter of victory. I say, then, that victory can be achieved. Though the enemy be stronger in numbers, we may prevent him from fighting. Scheme so as to discover his plans and the likelihood of their success. Rouse him and learn the principle of his activity or inactivity. Force him to reveal himself so as to find out his vulnerable spots. Carefully compare the opposing army with your own so that you may know where strength is superabundant and where it is deficient. In making tactical dispositions, the highest pitch you can attain is to conceal them. Conceal your dispositions, and you will be safe from the prying of the subtlest spies, from the machinations of the wisest brains. How victory may be produced for them out of the enemy's own tactics that is what the multitude cannot comprehend. 
All men can see the tactics whereby I conquer, but what none can see is the strategy out of which victory is evolved. Do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. Military tactics are like unto water, for water in its natural course runs away from high places and hastens downwards. So in war the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. Therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. He who can modify his tactics in relation to his opponent, and thereby succeed in winning, may be called a heaven-born captain. The five elements, water, fire, wood, metal, earth, are not always equally predominant. The four seasons make way for each in turn. There are short days and long. The moon has its periods of waning and waxing. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Maneuvering Sun Tzu said, In war the general receives his commands from the sovereign. Having collected an army and concentrated his forces, he must blend and harmonize the different elements thereof before pitching his camp. After that comes tactical maneuvering, than which there is nothing more difficult. The difficulty of tactical maneuvering consists in turning the devious into the direct and misfortune into gain. Thus, to take a long and circuitous route, after enticing the enemy out of the way, and though starting after him, to contrive to reach the goal before him, shows knowledge of the artifice of deviation. Maneuvering with an army is advantageous with an undisciplined multitude most dangerous. If you set a fully equipped army in march in order to snatch an advantage, the chances are that you will be too late. On the other hand, to detach a flying column for the purpose involves the sacrifice of its baggage and stores. Thus, if you order your men to roll up their buff coats and make forced marches without halting day or night, covering double the usual distance at a stretch, doing a hundred li in order to wrest an advantage, the leaders of all your three divisions will fall into the hands of the enemy. The stronger men will be in front, the jaded ones will fall behind, and on this plan only one-tenth of your army will reach its destination. If you march fifty li in order to outmaneuver the enemy, you will lose the leader of your first division, and only half your force will reach the goal. If you march thirty li with the same object, two-thirds of your army will arrive. We will take it, then, that an army without its baggage train is lost. Without provisions it is lost. Without bases of supply it is lost. We cannot enter into alliances until we are acquainted with the designs of our neighbors. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. We shall be unable to turn natural advantage to account unless we make use of local guides. In war, Practice dissimulation, and you will succeed. Whether to concentrate or to divide your troops must be decided by circumstances. Let your rapidity be that of the wind, your compactness that of the forest. In raiding and plundering be like fire, in immovability like a mountain. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. When you plunder a countryside, let the spoil be divided amongst your men. When you capture new territory, 
cut it up into allotments for the benefit of the soldiery. Ponder and deliberate before you make a move. He will conquer who has learnt the artifice of deviation. Such is the art of maneuvering. The Book of Army Management says, on the field of battle the spoken word does not carry far enough, hence the institution of gongs and drums. Nor can ordinary objects be seen clearly enough, hence the institution of banners and flags. Gongs and drums, banners and flags, are means whereby the ears and eyes of the host may be focused on one particular point. The host, thus forming a single united body, it is impossible either for the brave to advance alone, or for the cowardly to retreat alone. This is the art of handling large masses of men. In night fighting, then, make much use of signal fires and drums, and in fighting by day of flags and banners, as a means of influencing the ears and eyes of your army. A whole army may be robbed of its spirit. A commander-in-chief may be robbed of his presence of mind. Now a soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning, by noonday it has begun to flag, and in the evening his mind is bent only on returning to camp. A clever general, therefore, avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks it when it is sluggish and inclined to return. This is the art of studying moods. Disciplined and calm, to await the appearance of disorder and hubbub amongst the enemy, this is the art of retaining self-possession. To be near the goal, while the enemy is still far from it. To wait at ease, while the enemy is toiling and struggling. To be well fed, while the enemy is famished. This is the art of husbanding one's strength. To refrain from intercepting an enemy whose banners are in perfect order. To refrain from attacking an army drawn up in calm and confident array, this is the art of studying circumstances. It is a military axiom not to advance uphill against the enemy, nor to oppose him when he comes downhill. Do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. Do not attack soldiers whose temper is keen. Do not swallow bait offered by the enemy. Do not interfere with an army that is returning home. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free. Do not press a desperate foe too hard. Such is the art of warfare. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Variation in Tactics Sun Tzu said, In war the general receives his commands from the sovereign, collects his army, and concentrates his forces. When in difficult country do not encamp. In country where high roads intersect, join hands with your allies. Do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. In hemmed-in situations you must resort to stratagem. In desperate position you must fight. There are roads which must not be followed, armies which must be not attacked, towns which must not be besieged, positions which must not be contested, commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. The general, who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany variation of tactics, knows how to handle his troops. The general, who does not understand these, may be well acquainted with the configuration of the country, yet he will not be able to turn his knowledge to practical account. So the student of war, who is unversed in the art of war of varying his plans, even though he be acquainted with the five advantages, will fail to make the best use of his men. Hence the wise leader's plans, considerations of advantage and of disadvantage, will be blended together. If our expectation of advantage be tempered in this way, we may succeed in accomplishing the essential part of our schemes. If, on the other hand, in the midst of difficulties we are always ready to seize an advantage, 
we may extricate ourselves from misfortune. Reduce the hostile chiefs by inflicting damage on them, and make trouble for them, and keep them constantly engaged. Hold out specious allurements, and make them rush to any given point. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him, not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. 1. Recklessness which leads to destruction. 2. Cowardice which leads to capture. 3. A hasty temper which can be provoked by insults. 4. A delicacy of honor which is sensitive to shame. 5. Over-solicitude for his men which exposes him to worry and trouble. These are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. When an army is overthrown and its leader slain, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Let them be the subject of meditation. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Army on the March Sun Tzu said, We come now to the question of encamping the army and observing signs of the enemy. Pass quickly over mountains and keep in the neighborhood of valleys. Camp in high places facing the sun do not climb heights in order to fight. So much for mountain warfare. After crossing a river, you should get far away from it. When an invading force crosses a river in its onward march, do not advance to meet it in midstream. It will be best to let half the army get across and then deliver your attack. If you are anxious to fight, you should not go to meet the invader near a river which he has to cross moor your craft higher up than the enemy and facing the sun. Do not move upstream to meet the enemy. So much for river warfare. In crossing salt marshes your sole concern should be to get over them quickly without any delay. If forced to fight in a salt marsh you should have water and grass near you and get your back to a clump of trees. So much for operations in salt marshes. In dry level country, take up an easily accessible position with rising ground to your right and on your rear, so that the danger may be in front, and safely lie behind. So much for campaigning in flat country. There are four useful branches of military knowledge which enabled the Yellow Emperor to vanquish four several sovereigns. All armies prefer high ground to low and sunny places to dark. If you are careful of your men and camp on hard ground, the army will be free from disease of every kind, and this will spell victory. When you come to a hill or a bank, occupy the sunny side with the slope on your right rear. Thus you will at once act for the benefit of your soldiers and utilize the natural advantages of the ground. When, in consequence of heavy rains up country, a river which you wish to ford is swollen and flecked with foam, you must wait until it subsides. Country in which there are precipitous cliffs, with torrents running between, deep natural hollows, confined places, tangled thickets, quagmires and crevasses, should be left with all possible speed, and not approached. While we keep away from such places, we should get the enemy to approach them. While we face them, we should let the enemy have them on his rear. If in the neighborhood of your camp there should be any hilly country, ponds surrounded by aquatic grass, hollow basins filled with reeds or woods with thick undergrowth, they must be carefully routed out and searched. For these are places where men in ambush and insidious spies are likely to be lurking. When the enemy is close at hand and remains quiet, he is relying on the natural strength of his position. 
when he keeps aloof and tries to provoke a battle, he is anxious for the other side to advance. If his place of encampment is easy of access, he is tendering a bait. Movement amongst the trees of a forest shows that the enemy is advancing. The appearance of a number of screens in the midst of thick grass means that the enemy wants to make us suspicious. The rising of birds in their flight is the sign of an ambuscade. Startled beasts indicate that a sudden attack is coming. When there is dust rising in a high column, it is the sign of chariots advancing. When the dust is low but spread over a wide area, it betokens the approach of infantry. When it branches out in different directions, it shows that parties have been sent to collect firewood. A few clouds of dust moving to and fro signify that the army is encamping. Humble words and increased preparations are signs that the enemy is about to advance. Violent language and driving forward as if to attack are signs that he will retreat. When the light chariots come out first and take up position on the wings, it is a sign that the enemy is forming for battle. Peace proposals unaccompanied by a sworn covenant indicate a plot. When there is much running about and the soldiers fall into rank, it means that the critical moment has come. When some are seen advancing and some retreating, it is a lure. When the soldiers stand leaning on their spears, they are faint from want of food. If those who are sent to draw water begin by drinking themselves, the army is suffering from thirst. If the enemy sees an advantage to be gained and makes no effort to secure it, the soldiers are exhausted. If birds gather on any spot, it is unoccupied. Clamor by night betokens nervousness. If there is disturbance in the camp, the general's authority is weak. If the banners and flags are shifted about, sedition is afoot. If the officers are angry, it means that the men are weary. When an army feeds its horses with grain and kills its cattle for food, and when the men do not hang their cooking pots over the campfires, showing that they will not return to their tents, you may know that they are determined to fight to the death. The sight of men whispering together in small knots or speaking in subdued tones points to disaffection amongst the rank and file. Two frequent rewards signify that the enemy is at the end of his resources. Too many punishments betray a condition of dire distress. To begin by bluster, but afterwards to take fright at the enemy's numbers, shows a supreme lack of intelligence. When envoys are sent with compliments in their mouths, it is a sign that the enemy wishes for a truce. If the enemy's troops march up angrily and remain facing ours for a long time without either joining battle or taking themselves off again, the situation is one that demands great vigilance and circumspection. If our troops are no more in number than the enemy, that is amply sufficient. It only means that no direct attack can be made. What we can do is simply to concentrate all our available strength keep a close watch on the enemy, and obtain reinforcements. He who exercises no forethought but makes light of his opponents is sure to be captured by them. If soldiers are punished before they have grown attached to you, they will not prove submissive, and unless submissive then will be practically useless. If, when soldiers have become attached to you, punishments are not enforced, they will still be useless. Therefore, soldiers must be treated in the first instance with humanity, but kept under control by means of iron discipline. This is a certain road to victory. If in training soldiers commands are habitually enforced, the army will be well disciplined. If not, its discipline will be bad. If a general shows confidence in his men, but always insists on his orders being obeyed, the gain will be mutual. End of chapter 9、chapter、10 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Translated by Lionel Giles. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Terrain Sun Tzu said, We may distinguish six kinds of terrain, to wit, one, accessible ground, two, entangling ground, three, temporizing ground, four, narrow passes, five, precipitous heights, six, positions at a great distance from the enemy. Ground which can be freely traversed by both sides is called accessible. With regard to ground of this nature, be before the enemy in occupying the raised and sunny spots, and carefully guard your lines of supplies. Then you will be able to fight with advantage. Ground which can be abandoned but is hard to reoccupy is called entangling. From a position of this sort, if the enemy is unprepared, you may sally forth and defeat him. But if the enemy is prepared for your coming, and you fail to defeat him, then, return being impossible, disaster will ensue. When the position is such that neither side will gain by making the first move, it is called temporizing ground. In a position of this sort, even though the enemy should offer us an attractive bait, it will be advisable not to stir forth, but rather to retreat, thus enticing the enemy in his turn. Then, when part of his army is come out, we may deliver our attack with advantage. With regard to narrow passes, if you can occupy them first, let them be strongly garrisoned and await the advent of the enemy. Should the army forestall you in occupying a pass, do not go after him if the pass is fully garrisoned, but only if it is weakly garrisoned. With regard to precipitous heights, if you are beforehand with your adversary, you should occupy the raised and sunny spots and there wait for him to come up. If the enemy has occupied them before you, do not follow him, but retreat and try to entice him away. If you are situated at a great distance from the enemy and the strength of the two armies is equal, it is not easy to provoke a battle, and fighting will be to your disadvantage. These six are the principles connected with earth. The general who has attained a responsible post must be careful to study them. Now an army is exposed to six several calamities, not arising from natural causes, but from faults for which the general is responsible. These are one flight, two insubordination, three collapse, four ruin, five disorganization, six rout. Other conditions being equal, if one force is hurled against another ten times its size, the results will be the flight of the former. When the common soldiers are too strong and their officers too weak, the result is insubordination. When the officers are too strong and the common soldiers too weak, the result is collapse. When the higher officers are angry and insubordinate, and on meeting the enemy give battle on their own account from a feeling of resentment, before the commander-in-chief can tell whether or not he is in a position to fight, the result is ruin. When the general is weak and without authority, when his orders are not clear and distinct, when there are no fixed duties assigned to officers and men, and the ranks are formed in a slovenly, haphazard manner, the result is utter disorganization. When a general, unable to estimate the enemy's strength, allows an inferior force to engage a larger one, or hurls a weak detachment against a powerful one, and neglects to place picked soldiers in the front rank, the result must be rout. There are six ways of courting defeat, which must be carefully noted by the general who has attained a responsible post. The natural formation of the country is the soldier's best ally, but a power of estimating the adversary, of controlling the force of victory, and of shrewdly calculating difficulties, dangers, and distances, constitutes the test of a great general. He who knows these things, and in fighting, puts his knowledge into practice, will win his battles. He who knows them not, nor practices them, will surely be defeated. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight, even though the ruler forbid it. 
If fighting will not result in victory, then you must not fight even at the ruler's bidding. The general who advances without coveting fame and retreats without fearing disgrace, whose only thought is to protect his country and do good service for his sovereign, is the jewel of the kingdom. Regard your soldiers as your children, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. Look upon them as your own beloved sons, and they will stand by you even unto death. If, however, you are indulgent but unable to make your authority felt, kind-hearted but unable to enforce your commands, and incapable, moreover, of quelling disorder, then your soldiers must be likened to spoilt children. They are useless for any practical purpose. If we know that our own men are in a condition to attack, but are unaware that the enemy is not open to attack, we have gone only halfway towards victory. If we know that the enemy is open to attack, but are unaware that our own men are not in condition to attack, we have gone only halfway towards victory. If we know that the enemy is open to attack, and also know that our men are in a condition to attack, but are unaware that the nature of the ground makes fighting impracticable, we have still gone only halfway towards victory. Hence the experienced soldier, once in motion, is never bewildered. Once he has broken camp, he is never at a loss. Hence the saying, If you know the enemy and know yourself, your victory will not stand in doubt. If you know heaven and know earth, you may make your victory complete. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Nine Situations Sun Tzu said, The art of war recognizes nine varieties of ground. Dispersive ground, facile ground, contentious ground, open ground, ground of intersecting highways, serious ground, difficult ground, hemmed-in ground, desperate ground. When a chieftain is fighting in his own territory, it is dispersive ground. When he has penetrated into hostile territory, but to no great distance, it is facile ground. Ground the possession of which imports great advantage to either side is contentious ground. Ground on which each side has liberty of movement is open ground. Ground which forms the key to three contiguous states, so that he who occupies it first has most of the empire at his command is a ground of intersecting highways. When an army has penetrated into the heart of a hostile country, leaving a number of fortified cities in its rear, it is serious ground. Mountain forests, rugged steeps, marshes, and fens, all country that is hard to traverse, this is difficult ground. Ground which is reached through narrow gorges, and from which we can only retire by tortuous paths, so that a small number of the enemy would suffice to crush a large body of our men, this is hemmed-in ground. Ground on which we can only be saved from destruction by fighting without delay is desperate ground. On dispersive ground, therefore, fight not. On facile ground, Halt not. On contentious ground, attack not. On open ground, do not try to block the enemy's way. On the ground of intersecting highways, join hands with your allies. On serious ground, gather in plunder. In difficult ground, keep steadily on the march. On hemmed-in ground, resort to stratagem. On desperate ground, fight. Those who were called skillful leaders of old knew how to drive a wedge between the enemy's front and rear, to prevent cooperation between his large and small divisions, to hinder the good troops from rescuing the bad, the officers from rallying their men. 
When the enemy's men were united, they managed to keep them in disorder. When it was to their advantage, they made a forward move, when otherwise they stopped still. If asked how to cope with a great host of the enemy in orderly array and on the point of marching to the attack, I should say, begin by seizing something which your opponent holds dear. Then he will be amenable to your will. Rapidity is the essence of war. Take advantage of the enemy's unreadiness. Make your way by unexpected routes and attack unguarded spots. The following are the principles to be observed by an invading force. The further you penetrate into a country, the greater will be the solidarity of your troops, and thus the defenders will not prevail against you. Make forays in fertile country in order to supply your army with food. Carefully study the well-being of your men and do not overtax them. Concentrate your energy and hoard your strength. Keep your army continually on the move and devise unfathomable plans. Throw your soldiers into positions whence there is no escape, and they will prefer death to flight. If they will face death, there is nothing they may not achieve. Officers and men alike will put forth their uttermost strength. Soldiers, when in desperate straits, lose the sense of fear. If there is no place of refuge, they will stand firm. If they are in hostile country, they will show a stubborn front. If there is no help for it, they will fight hard. Thus, without waiting to be marshaled, the soldiers will be constantly on the qui vive, without waiting to be asked, and they will do your will without restrictions, they will be faithful. Without giving orders, they can be trusted. Prohibit the taking of omens, and do away with superstitious doubts. Then, until death itself comes, no calamity need be feared. If our soldiers are not overburdened with money, it is not because they have a distaste for riches. If their lives are not unduly long, it is not because they are disinclined to longevity. On the day they are ordered out to battle, your soldiers may weep, those sitting up bedewing their garments, and those lying down, letting the tears run down their cheeks. But let them once be brought to bay, and they will display the courage of a chu or kuei. The skillful tactician may be likened to a shuijan. Now the Shuijan is a snake that is found in the Chung Mountains. Strike at its head, and you will be attacked by its tail. Strike at its tail, and you will be attacked by its head. Strike at its middle, and you will be attacked by head and tail both. Asked if an army can be made to imitate the Shuijan, I should answer yes. For the men of Wu and the men of Huei are enemies. Yet, if they are crossing a river in the same boat, and are caught by a storm, they will come to each other's assistance, just as the left hand helps the right. Hence, it is not enough to put one's trust in the tethering of horses and the burying of chariot wheels in the ground. The principle on which to manage an army is to set up one standard of courage which all must reach. How to make the best of both strong and weak? That is a question involving the proper use of ground. Thus the skillful general conducts his army just as though he were leading a single man, willy-nilly by the hand. It is the business of a general to be quiet, and thus ensure secrecy, upright and just, and thus maintain order. He must be able to mystify his officers and men by false reports and appearances, and thus keep them in total ignorance. By altering his arrangements and changing his plans, he keeps the enemy without definite knowledge. By shifting his camp and taking circuitous routes, he prevents the enemy from anticipating his purpose. At the critical moment, the leader of an army acts like one who has climbed up a height and then kicks away the ladder behind him. He carries his men deep into hostile territory before he shows his hand. He burns his boats and breaks his cooking pots. Like a shepherd driving a flock of sheep, he drives his men this way and that, and nothing knows whither he is going. 
to muster his host and bring it into danger, this may be termed the business of the general. The different measures suited to the nine varieties of ground, the expediency of aggressive or defensive tactics, and the fundamental laws of human nature, these are things that must most certainly be studied. When invading hostile territory, the general principle is that penetrating deeply brings cohesion, penetrating but a short way means dispersion. When you leave your own country behind and take your army across neighborhood territory, you find yourself on critical ground. When there are means of communication on all four sides, the ground is one of intersecting highways. When you penetrate deeply into a country, it is serious ground. When you penetrate but a little way, it is facile ground. When you have the enemy's strongholds on your rear and narrow passes in front, it is hemmed-in ground. When there is no place of refuge at all, it is desperate ground. Therefore, on dispersive ground I would inspire my men with unity of purpose. On facile ground I would see that there is close connection between all parts of my army. On contentious ground I would hurry up my rear. On open ground I would keep a vigilant eye on my defenses. On ground of intersecting highways I would consolidate my alliances. On serious ground I would try to ensure a continuous stream of supplies. On difficult ground I would keep pushing on along the road. On hemmed-in ground I would block any way of retreat. On desperate ground I would proclaim to my soldiers the hopelessness of saving their lives. For it is the soldier's disposition to offer an obstinate resistance when surrounded, to fight hard when he cannot help himself, and to obey promptly when he has fallen into danger. We cannot enter into alliance with neighboring princes until we are acquainted with their designs. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. We shall be unable to turn natural advantages to account unless we make use of local guides. To be ignorant of any one of the following four or five principles does not befit a warlike prince. When a warlike prince attacks a powerful state, his generalship shows itself in preventing the concentration of the enemy's forces. He overawes his opponents, and their allies are prevented from joining against him. Hence he does not strive to ally himself with all and sundry, nor does he foster the power of other states. He carries out his own secret designs, keeping his antagonists in awe. Thus he is able to capture their cities and overthrow their kingdoms. Bestow rewards without regard to rule, issue orders without regard to previous arrangements, and you will be able to handle a whole army as though you had to do with but a single man. Confront your soldiers with the deed itself. Never let them know your design. When the outlook is bright, bring it before their eyes, but tell them nothing when the situation is gloomy. Place your army in deadly peril, and it will survive. Plunge it into desperate straits, and it will come off in safety. For it is precisely when a force has fallen into harm's way that it is capable of striking a blow for victory. Success in warfare is gained by carefully accommodating ourselves to the enemy's purpose. By persistently hanging on the enemy's flank, we shall succeed in the long run in killing the commander-in-chief. This is called ability to accomplish a thing by sheer cunning. On the day that you take up your command, block the frontier passes, destroy the official tallies, and stop the passage of all emissaries. Be stern in the council chamber so that you may control the situation. If the enemy leaves the door open, you must rush in. Forestall your opponent by seizing what he holds dear, and subtly contrive to time his arrival on the ground. Walk in the path defined by rule, and accommodate yourself to the enemy until you can fight a decisive battle. At first, then, exhibit the coyness of a maiden, 
until the enemy gives you an opening, afterwards emulate the rapidity of a running hare, and it will be too late for the enemy to oppose you. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 The Attack by Fire Sun Tzu said there are five ways of attacking with fire. The first is to burn soldiers in their camp. The second is to burn stores. The third is to burn baggage trains. The fourth is to burn arsenals and magazines. The fifth is to hurl dropping fire amongst the enemy. In order to carry out an attack we must have means available. The materials for raising fire should always be kept in readiness. There is a proper season for making attacks with fire, and special days for starting a conflagration. The proper season is when the weather is very dry. The special days are those when the moon is in the constellations of the sieve, the wall, the wing, or the crossbar, for these four are all days of rising wind. In attacking with fire, one should be prepared to meet five possible developments. 1. When fire breaks out inside the enemy's camp, respond at once with an attack from without. Two. If there is an outbreak of fire, but the enemy's soldiers remain quiet, bide your time and do not attack. 3. When the force of the flames has reached its height, follow it up with an attack, if that is practicable. If not, stay where you are. 4. If it is possible to make an assault with fire from without, do not wait for it to break out within, but deliver your attack at a favorable moment. 5. When you start a fire, be to windward of it. Do not attack from the leeward. A wind that rises in the daytime lasts long, but a night breeze soon falls. In every army the five developments connected with fire must be known. The movements of the stars calculated and a watch kept for the proper days. Hence those who use fire as an aid to the attack show intelligence, those who use water as an aid to the attack gain an accession of strength. By means of water an enemy may be intercepted, but not robbed of all his belongings. Unhappy is the fate of one who tries to win his battles and succeed in his attacks without cultivating the spirit of enterprise, for the result is waste of time and general stagnation. Hence the saying, the enlightened ruler lays his plans well ahead, the good general cultivates his resources. Move not unless you see an advantage, use not your troops unless there is something to be gained. Fight not unless the position is critical. No ruler should put troops into the field merely to gratify his own spleen. No general should fight a battle simply out of pique. If it is to your advantage, make a forward move. If not, stay where you are. Anger may in time change to gladness. Vexation may be succeeded by content. But a kingdom that has once been destroyed can never come again into being, nor can the dead ever be brought back to life. Hence the enlightened ruler is heedful and the good general full of caution. This is the way to keep a country at peace and an army intact. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The Use of Spies Sun Tzu said, Raising a host of a hundred thousand men, and marching them great distances entails heavy loss on the people and a drain on the resources of the state. The daily expenditure will amount to a thousand ounces of silver. There will be commotion at home and abroad, and men will drop down exhausted on the highways. As many as seven hundred thousand families will be impeded in their labor. 
hostile armies may face each other for years, striving for victory which is decided in a single day. This being so, to remain in ignorance of the enemy's condition simply because one begrudges the outlay of a hundred ounces of silver in honors and emollients is the height of inhumanity. One who acts thus is no leader of men, no present help to his sovereign, no master of victory. Thus what enables the wise sovereign and the good general to strike and conquer and achieve things beyond the reach of ordinary men is foreknowledge. Now this foreknowledge cannot be elicited from spirits. It cannot be obtained inductively from experience, nor by any deductive calculation. Knowledge of the enemy's dispositions can only be obtained from other men. Hence the use of spies, of whom there are five classes. One, local spies, two, inward spies, three, converted spies, four, doomed spies, five, surviving spies. When these five kinds of spy are all at work, none can discover the secret system. This is called divine manipulation of the threads. It is the sovereign's most precious faculty. Having local spies means employing the services of the inhabitants of a district. Having inward spies making use of officials of the enemy. Having converted spies getting hold of the enemy's spies and using them for our purposes. Having doomed spies, doing certain things openly for purposes of deception, and allowing our spies to know of them and report them to the enemy. Surviving spies, finally, are those who bring back news from the enemy's camp. Hence it is that none in the whole army are more intimate relations to be maintained than with spies. None should be more liberally rewarded. In no other business should greater secrecy be preserved. Spies cannot be usefully employed without certain intuitive sagacity. They cannot be properly managed without benevolence and straightforwardness. Without subtle ingenuity of mind, one cannot make certain of the truth of their reports. Be subtle, be subtle, and use your spies for every kind of business. If a secret piece of news is divulged by a spy before the time is ripe, he must be put to death together with the man to whom the secret was told. Whenever the object be to crush an army, to storm a city, or to assassinate an individual, it is always necessary to begin by finding out the names of the attendants, the aides-de-camp, and doorkeepers, and sentries of the general in command. Our spies must be commissioned to ascertain these. The enemy spies who have come to spy on us must be sought out, tempted with bribes, led away and comfortably housed. Thus they will become converted spies and available for our service. It is through the information brought by the converted spy that we are able to acquire and employ local and inward spies. It is owing to his information, again, that we can cause the doomed spy to carry false tidings to the enemy. Lastly, it is by his information that the surviving spy can be used on appointed occasions. The end and aim of spying in all its five varieties is knowledge of the enemy, and this knowledge can only be derived, in the first instance, from the converted spy. Hence it is essential that the converted spy be treated with the utmost liberality. Of old, the rise of the Yin dynasty was due to Ai Ching, who had served under Hisha. Likewise, the rise of the Chu dynasty was due to Lu Ya, who had served under the Yin. Hence it is only the enlightened ruler and the wise general who will use the highest intelligence of the army for purposes of spying, and thereby they achieve great results. Spies are the most important element in water, because on them depends an army's ability to move. End of chapter 13 End of The Art of War by Sun Tzu Translated by Lionel Giles This book read by Phil Chenever, December 2012, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana.
summary of the Art of War Sun Tzu Wu was a native of the Qi state. His Art of War brought him to the notice of Ho Lu, King of Wu. Ho Lu asked, May the test be applied to women? The answer was again in the affirmative, so arrangements were made to bring 180 ladies out of the palace. He divided them into two companies and placed one of the king's favorite concubines at the head of each. Sun Wu and his book SSU Ma Qian gives the following biography of Sun Tzu. When Sun Tzu was appointed general of His Majesty's army, he had the two leaders beheaded, and installed the pair next order as leaders in their place. When this had been done, the drum was sounded for the drill once more, and the girls went through all the evolutions, marching ahead or wheeling back, kneeling or standing, with perfect accuracy and precision, not venturing a sound. About Sun Tzu himself, this is all that SSU Ma Qian has to tell us in this chapter. Ho Lu, King of Wu, took the field in the third year of his reign, 512 BC, and defeated Chu in five pitched battles, and marched into Ying. He is mentioned in two other passages of the Shi Qi, in the third year of his reign, 512 BC. Ho Lu, King of Wu, took the field with Su Hsu, i.e. Wu Yuan, and Po Pie, and attacked Chu. This is the latest date at which anything is recorded of Sun Wu. SSU Ma Qian at least had no doubt about the reality of Sun Wu as a historical personage, and with one exception he is by far the most important authority on the period in question. The Shi Qi's account of Sun Tzu will be found, for what it is worth noting, in Chapter 2 of the Huai Nan Tzt, which is said to have been written by Chao Ye in the 1st century AD. Assuming that this work is genuine, and hitherto no doubt has been cast upon it, we have here the earliest direct reference for Sun Tzu, for Huai Nan Tzu died in 122 BC, many years before the Shi Qi was given to the world. Sun Wu's grandfather Sun Pin was the father of Sun Tzu, who defeated Wei in 341 BC. According to this account, Sun Wu was the grandson of Wu, which, considering that Sun Pin's victory over Wei was gained in 341 BC, may be dismissed as chronologically impossible. An interesting document that has survived from the close of the Han period is the short preface written by the great Cao Cao, or Wei Wu Ti, for his edition of Sun Wu Ti. Instances of this are Fu Chai, 11, on the one hand and Yen Wang on the other. Sun Tzu was a native of the Qi state, his personal name was Wu. He wrote The Art of War in 13 chapters for Ho Lu, King of Wu. His principles were tested on women, and he was subsequently made a general. A hundred years and more after his time, Sun Pin lived. Pai Ai Sun. It is evident that this cannot be merely the 13 chapters known to SSU Ma Qian, or those we possess today. Then the numerous other treatises attributed to Sun Tzu might be included. The two states, Chu and Wu, had been constantly at war for over half a century, whereas the first war between Wu and Yu was waged only in 510. Shi Qi mentions Sun Wu as general. But what has hitherto escaped notice is that they also seriously impair the credibility of SSU Ma Qian's narrative. Shi Qi Sun Sing Yen's commentary on the history of Wu Su Hsu implies that Ho Lu died in 496 so if the book was written for him, it must have been during the period 505 to 496 when there was a lull in the hostilities. How then did the Sun Tzu legend originate? The capture of Ying was undoubtedly the greatest feat of arms in Ho Lu's reign. It made a deep and lasting impression on all the surrounding states and raised Wu to the short-lived zenith of her power. Sun Tzu's 13 chapters, of which SSU Ma Qian speaks, were essentially the same as those now extant. There is no reasonable ground to suppose that Cao Kung tampered with the text. But the text itself is often so obscure that it would be surprising if numerous corruptions had not managed to creep in. Sun Sing Yen says in his preface, during the Qin and Han dynasties Sun Tzu's art of war was in general use amongst military commanders, but they seem to have treated it as a work of mysterious import and were unwilling to expound it for the benefit of posterity. Qi Tian Pao's Sun Tzu appears in the war section of the Great Imperial Encyclopedia printed in 1726, the Ku Qin Tu Shu Qi Cheng. Sun Sing Yen, 1752-1818, a distinguished antiquarian and classical scholar, who claimed to be a descendant of Sun Wu, accidentally discovered a copy of his work. The government ordered that the ancient edition, of Qi Tian Pao, should be used and that the text should be revised and corrected throughout. Wu Nain Hu, Governor Pai Kua, and Shi, a graduate of the second degree, devoted themselves to this study, probably surprisingly therein. They took the original edition as their basis, 
and by careful comparison with older versions restored a very large number of doubtful passages. This is followed by Cao Kung's preface to his edition, and the biography of Sun Tzu from the Shi Qi, both translated above. It opens with a preface by Sun Sing Yen, largely quoted in this introduction, vindicating the traditional view of Sun Tzu's life and performances, and summing up in a remarkably concise fashion the evidence in its favor. Sun Tzu can boast an exceptionally long distinguished role of commentators, which would do honor to any classic. Oh Yang Hsiu remarks on this fact, though he wrote before the tale was complete, and rather ingeniously explains it by saying that the artifices of war, being inexhaustible, must be susceptible of treatment in a great variety of ways. Cao Kung's notes are models of austere brevity, so thoroughly characteristic of the stern commander known to history, that it is hard indeed to conceive of them as the work of a mere literateur. Qi Tian Pao's edition places Sun Sing Yen Cao Kung after Qi Lin, but this is a mistake. The commentary which has come down to us under this name is comparatively meager, and nothing about the author is known. Lich Yuan of the 8th century was a well-known writer on military tactics. He is named in one work as the last of the five commentators, the others being Wei Wu Ti, Tu Mu, Qin Hao, and Chia Lin. According to Chao Kung Wu and the TNI Co catalog, he followed a variant of the text of Sun Tzu which differs considerably from those now extant. Chao Kung Wu's notes on Sun Tzu are very copious and replete with historical parallels. Tu Mu's somewhat spiteful charge against Cao Kung has already been considered elsewhere. Mei Yao Ch. N. 1002-1060, is of somewhat scanty texture, and in point of quality, perhaps the least valuable of the eleven. Tu Mu's somewhat spiteful charge against Cao Kung has already been considered elsewhere. Sun Tzu's sayings were intended for states engaged in internecine warfare, and the author is not concerned with the military conditions prevailing under the sovereigns of the three ancient dynasties, nor with the nine punitive measures prescribed to the minister of war. Sun Wu loved the brevity of diction, but his meaning is always deep. Mei Sheng Yu has brushed aside all the obstinate prejudices of these critics and has tried to bring out the true meaning of Sun Tzu himself. Wang Shi, also of the Sung dynasty, is decidedly original in some of his interpretations, but much less judicious than Mei Yao Qin, and on the whole not a very trustworthy guide. He is fond of comparing his own commentary with that of Cao Kung, but the comparison is not often flattering to him. A commentator of no great originality perhaps, but gifted with admirable powers of lucid exposition. Ma Tuan Lin quotes Cheng Qiao as saying that his personal name is unknown. Ho Shi of the Yu Hai and Chang Yu of the TNI Co catalog. Hence it is that the commentators of Sun Tzu in our dynasty belong mainly to that period. His commentator is based on that of Cao Kung, whose terse sentences he contrives to expand and develop in a masterly fashion. Sun Tzu has exercised a potent fascination over the minds of some of China's greatest men. Wu Qi was a man of the same stamp as Sun Wu, they both wrote books on war, and they are linked together as Sun and Wu. 52. The opinion of Cao Kung, who disputes with Han Xin for the highest place in Chinese military annals, has already been recorded. Cheng Hao. Sun Tzu's 13 chapters are the staple and base of all military men's training. Cheng Hao, such works as the Lun Yu, the I Ching and the Great Commentary, 57, as well as the writings of Mencius, Sun Kei Wang and Yang Chu, all fall below the level of Sun Tzu. Language of this sort encourages a ruler's bent towards unrelenting warfare and reckless militarism. But he is no advocate of peace at any price. The stormy years which followed the breakup of the Qin dynasty are illuminated by the transcendent genius of Han Xin. Tu Mu's commentary on Sun Tzu, in which he criticizes stale formulas about virtue and civilization, condemns the use of military weapons. Tu Mu, what then shall be said of those scholars of our time, blind to all great issues, and without any appreciation of relative values? They will surely bring our country to impotence and dishonor. There is no intrinsic difference between the punishment of flogging and cutting off heads in war. For the lesser infractions of the law, which are easily dealt with, only a small amount of force need to be employed. In both cases, however, the end in view is to get rid of wicked people and to give comfort and relief to the good. Sun Sing Yen, the editor of Sun Tzu, argues that Confucius never studied or received instruction in the art of war. The great Chu Shi appeals to the authority of the classics, how can it be said that these two great sages had no knowledge of military matters? Confucius said, if I fight, I conquer. 
The men of the present day misinterpret these words in their narrowest sense, as though he meant that all military theory was not worth reading. These people ignore the fact that the studies of our scholars and the civil administration of our officials also require steady application and practice to reach efficiency. Hence it is essential that Sun Tzu's 13 chapters should be studied. The notes on each have been drawn principally from the SSU Ku Qian Shu Chen Ming Mu Lu, ch. 9, full, 22 SQQ. C Shi Qi, ch. 65. The following are the oldest Chinese treatises on war, after Sun Tzu. 4. Wei Liao Su, in 5 Xuan. Li Qing Ping Fa, not to be confounded with the foregoing, is a short treatise in eight chapters, preserved in the SSU Ku Qian Shu, but not published separately. 5. Shi Qi, ch. 31. 7. The Appellation of Hu Yen, mentioned in ch. 39 under the year 637. Cao Kung seems to be thinking of the first part of Chap. 2, perhaps especially of Section 8. Ye Shi of the Sung Dynasty hardly deserves to be bracketed with assassins. When Wu first appears in the Qin Chiu in 584, it is already at variance with its powerful neighbor. 17. Ye Shi of the Sung Dynasty, 1151-1223. Lu Li Yin, Sun Wu, on the other hand, cannot have been widely known to fame in the 5th century. This is a discussion of 29 difficult passages in Sun Tzu. C. Shi Qi, ch. 47.62. The few Europeans who have yet had an opportunity of acquainting themselves with Sun Tzu are not behindhand in their praise. Sun Sing Yen might have quoted Confucius again. Shi Qi Sun Tzu, ch. 32-12, the art of war is of vital importance to the state. Cao Kung was a former minister of Chu Xin, better known as Xiang Yu, 233-202 BC. Further details on Tai Kung will be found in the Shi Qi, add in it. It appears from what follows that Sun Tzu means by moral law, a principle of harmony, not unlike the Tao of Lao Tzu in its moral aspect. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. Tu Mu alludes to the story of Cao Cao AD 155-220, who condemned himself to death for allowing his horse to shy into a field of corn. Sun Tzu's treatise was composed expressly for the benefit of his patron Ho Lu, king of the Wu state. To you, by means of these seven considerations I can forecast victory or defeat. Among them, in which army is there the most absolute certainty that merit will be properly rewarded and misdeeds summarily punished? The form of this paragraph reminds us that Sun Tzu's treatise was composed expressly for the benefit of his patron Ho Lu, king of the Wu state. When able to attack, we must seem unable, says Sun Tzu, quoted by Chang Yu. When he is in disorder, crush him, adds to you of the Yulan, if sovereign and subject are in accord, put a division between them. Hold out baits to entice the enemy. Pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant, says Wang Zan. Wang Su, quoted by Tu Yu, says that the good tactician plays with his adversary as a cat plays with a mouse, first feigning weakness and immobility, and then suddenly pouncing upon him. Sun Tzu said, how much more do many calculations lead to victory, and few calculations to defeat, how much more no calculation at all. Cao Kung has the note, he who wishes to fight must first count the cost, which prepares us for the subject of the chapter. Cao Kung, Li Qian, Meng Shi, Tu Yu, Tu Mu, and Mei Yao Qin have notes to the effect that a general, though naturally stupid, may nevertheless conquer through sheer force of rapidity. Sun Tzu, when your weapons are dulled, your ardor damped, your strength exhausted and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences. Sun Tzu, he who does not know the evils of war cannot appreciate its benefits, is distinctly pointless. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, and nor are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. He will not waste precious time waiting for reinforcements, nor will he return his army back to the enemy's frontier without delay. When their substance is drained away, the peasantry will be afflicted by heavy exactions. Cao Kung understands it as an army that has already crossed the frontier. Government expenses for broken chariots, worn-out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, draft oxen, and heavy wagons, will amount to four-tenths of its total revenue. 
Sun Tzu said, in the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact, to shatter and destroy it is not so good. So, too, it is better to capture an army entirely than to destroy it. Sao Kung, according to SSU Mar FA, consisted nominally of 12,500 men, according to Sao Kung, the equivalent of a regiment contained 500 men. The rule is, not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided, as the Boers learned from their failure to do so in 1899. Sao Kung simply defines them as, large shields, but we get a better idea of them from Li Qian, who says they were to protect the heads of those who were assaulting the city walls at close quarters. Sun Tzu Sao Kung. And thus, the weapon not being blunted by use, its keenness remains perfect. We are reminded of the terrible losses of the Japanese before Port Arthur, in the most recent siege which history has to record. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. If attackers and attack to equally matched in strength, only the able general will fight, if slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy. Chang Yu reminds us that the saying only applies if the other factors are equal, as small difference in numbers is often more than counterbalanced by superior energy and discipline. Li Qian tersely puts it, Gap indicates deficiency. Sao Kung and Chang Yu, humanity and justice are the principles on which to govern a state, but not an army. Opportunism and flexibility, on the other hand, are military rather than civil virtues to assimilate the governing of an army, to that of a state, understood. Tu Yu quotes Wang Su as saying, By applying the art of war, it is possible with a lesser force to defeat a greater, and vice versa. The secret lies in an eye for locality, and in not letting the right moment slip. 1. Sun Tzu said, the good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat, and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. T.S. Aokang explains the Chinese meaning of the words for the title of this chapter, marching and countermarching on the part of the two armies with a view to discovering each other's condition. Sun Tzu reserves his approbation for things that the world's coarse thumb and finger fail to plumb. Li Qian alludes to the story of Han Xin, when about to attack the vastly superior army of Chao, which was strongly entrenched in the city of Chang'an. Li Qian alludes to the story of Han Xin who, when about to attack the vastly superior army of Chao, which was strongly entrenched in the city of Chang'an, said to his officers, Gentlemen, we are going to annihilate the enemy, and shall meet again at dinner. A clever fighter is one who not only wins but excels in winning with ease. His victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. Ho Shi gives real instances of strength, sharp sight, and quick hearing. Wu Huo, a man who could lift a tripod weighing 250 stone. Li Chu, a blind musician who could hear the footsteps of a mosquito. In respect of military method, we have, firstly, measurement, secondly, estimation of quantity, thirdly, calculation, fourthly, balancing of chances, fifthly, victory. Ho Shi, if you will not begin with stratagem but rely on brute strength alone, victory will no longer be assured. Sun Tzu, the control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men, it is merely a question of dividing up their numbers. Tu Mu reminds us of Han Xin's famous reply to the first Han Emperor when asked how many troops he could lead. Not more than 100,000 men, your majesty. Mei Yao Qin, Qi is active, Cheng is passive, passivity means waiting for an opportunity, activity brings the victory itself. Ho Shi, we must cause the enemy to regard our straightforward attack as one that is secretly designed, and vice versa. Sao Kung, going straight out to join battle is a direct operation, appearing on the enemy's rear is an indirect maneuver. Chang Yu, military writers do not agree with regard to the meaning of Qi and Cheng. Qi and Han Shu, ch. 3. Sun Tzu is not speaking of Cheng at all, unless, we suppose with Cheng Yuxian that a clause relating to it has fallen out of the text. In all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle, but indirect methods will be needed in order to secure victory. Sun Tzu, the good fighter will be terrible in his onset, and prompt in his decision. Wang Shi, none of the commentators seem to grasp the real point of the simile of energy and the force stored up in the bent crossbow until released by the finger on the trigger. Tu Mu, this is how the psychological moment should be seized in war. Sao Kung, simulated disorder postulates perfect discipline, simulated fear postulates courage, simulated weakness postulates strength. Tu Mu, if you wish to feign confusion in order to lure the enemy on, you must first have perfect discipline. Sao Kung's note is, make a display of weakness and want. 
Note the following anecdote of Sun Pin, a descendant of Sun Wu, the emperor, however, disregarding this advice, fell into the trap and found himself surrounded at Poteng. Sun Pin's army was routed by Pang Xuan, who cut his own throat with an exclamation of despair after the rout of his army. When the clever combatant uses combined energy, he does not require too much from individuals and does not demand perfection from the untalented. Great results, he adds, can thus be achieved with small forces. Chapter 6. Weak Points and Strong. The Art of Combusting Weak and Strong Points. Sun Tzu Sao Kung says, Whoever is first in the field and awaits the coming of the enemy, will be fresh for the fight. Wang Shi, you can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended, or where the defenders are variants amongst themselves. Chang Yu, he who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven, making it impossible for the enemy to guard against him. This being so, the places that I shall attack are precisely those that the enemy cannot defend. Tu Mu, Qin Hao, and Mei Yao Qin assume the meaning to be, in order to make your defense quite safe, you must defend even those places that are not likely to be attacked. Taken thus, the clause balances less well with the preceding one. Sun Tzu, unlike certain generals in the late Boer War, was no believer in frontal attacks. He said, if we wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement even though he is sheltered behind a high rampart and a deep ditch. All we need do is attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve. Col. Henderson, if we are able to attack an inferior force with a superior one, our opponents will be in dire straits. General Grant, we can form a hole pitted against separate parts of a hole, which means that we shall be many to the enemy's few. What Sun Tzu evidently has in mind is that nice calculation of distances and that masterly employment of strategy which enable a general to divide his army for the purpose of a long and rapid march, and afterward to effect a junction at precisely the right spot and the right hour in order to confront the enemy in overwhelming strength. Chang Yu's note may be worth quoting here, Sun Tzu says that if the enemy is fully prepared, one cannot make certain of beating him. With his present assertion compare IV. CF. Section 4. Chang Yu. One may know how to conquer without being able to do it. Whereas here we have the statement that, victory, can be achieved. Tu Mu, hide your dispositions, and you will be safe from the prying of the subtlest spies. Wang Shi. There is but one root principle underlying victory, but the tactics which lead up to it are infinite in number. The five elements, water, fire, wood, metal, earth, earth, are not always equally predominant. 34. The five elements, water, fire, wood, metal, earth, are not always equally predominant, that is, as Wang Shi says, they predominate alternately, the four seasons make way for each other in turn. The purport of the passage is simply to illustrate the want of fixity in war by the changes constantly taking place in nature. The comparison is not very happy, however, because the regularity of nature's phenomena is by no means paralleled in war. The comparison is not very happy, however, because the regularity of the phenomena that Sun Tzu mentions is by no means paralleled in war. I have departed slightly from the traditional interpretation of Sao Kung, who says, from the time of receiving the sovereign's instructions until our encampment over against the enemy, the tactics to be pursued are most difficult. Sun Tzu Sao Kung, make it appear that you are a long way off, then cover the distance rapidly and arrive on the scene before your opponent. Tu Mu, hoodwink the enemy, so that he may be remiss and leisurely while you are dashing along with utmost speed. Ho Shi, although you may have difficult ground to traverse and natural obstacles to encounter this is a drawback that can be turned into an actual advantage by celerity of movement. Tu Mu cites the famous march of Chao Shi in 270 BC to relieve the town of Ou, which was closely invested by a Qin army. She fully admitted the hazardous nature of the march, but finally said, we shall be like two rats fighting in a hole, and the pluckier one will win. The king of Chao had only gone a distance of 30 li when he stopped and began throwing up entrenchments. For 28 days he continued strengthening his fortifications and took care that spies should carry the intelligence to the enemy. A crushing defeat followed for the Qin forces, who were forced to raise the siege of Ou in all haste and retreat across the border. Maneuvering with an army is advantageous, with an undisciplined multitude, most dangerous. The commentators using the standard text take this line to mean that maneuvers may be profitable, or they may be dangerous, it all depends on the ability of the general. Stonewall Jackson said, The hardships of forced marches are often more painful than the dangers of battle. 
On the whole, it is clear that Sun Tzu does not approve of a lengthy march being undertaken without supplies. The moral is, as Cao Kung and others point out, don't march a hundred li to gain a tactical advantage, either with or without impedimenta. Some of the Chinese text is unintelligible to the Chinese commentators, who paraphrase the sentence. If you march 30th Li with the same object, two-thirds of your army will arrive, says Sun Tzu. Literally, the leader of the first division will be torn away, in the Tiung Tian. He adds, from this, we may know the difficulty of maneuvering. When you plunder the countryside, let the spoil be divided among your men. Sun Tzu wishes to lessen the abuses of indiscriminate plundering by insisting that all booty shall be thrown into a common stock, which may afterward be fairly divided amongst all. It is by acting on this principle, and harvesting the lands they invaded, that the Chinese have succeeded in carrying out some of their most memorable and triumphant expeditions. He goes on to say, equally guilty are those who advance against orders and those who retreat against orders. Chang Yu, if a spirit of anger can be made to pervade all ranks of an army at one and the same time, its onset will be irresistible. Sao Kue, in battle, a courageous spirit is everything. Wu Su, the value of a whole army. A mighty host of a million men, is dependent on one man alone, such is the influence of spirit. Livy. A clever general avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks it when it is sluggish and inclined to return. Livy. Do not interfere with an army that is returning home. Qin Hao and Chang Yu carefully point out that the saying has a wider application. Chang Yu quotes the words of Han Xin. Invincible is the soldier who hath his desire and returneth homewards. He adds that a man whose heart is set on returning home will fight to the death against any attempt to bar his way, and is therefore too dangerous to be tackled. Chinese General Fu Yenqing made a sudden and unexpected onslaught with his cavalry, routed the barbarians, and succeeded in breaking through to safety. For a number of maxims on this head, see, Marshal Chiren, Longmans, 1907, p. 29. Wang Shi, all it means is that in warfare we ought to vary our tactics to the utmost degree. 1. Sun Tzu said, in war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign, collects his army, and concentrates his forces. I do not know what Cao Kung makes these nine variations out to be, but it has been suggested that they are connected with the nine situations, of Chapt. 11. When Cao Kung invaded Hsu Chu, he ignored the city of Hua Pai, which lay directly in his path, and pressed on into the heart of the country. Chang Yu says, no town should be attacked which, if taken, cannot be held, or if left alone, will not cause any trouble. In the 17th century, sieges still formed a large proportion of Chinese warfare. Cao Cao Kung, if a ruler's commands must be obeyed, there are five obvious and generally advantageous lines of action. But there are circumstances that sometimes forbid a general to use these advantages. Chia Lin, whether in an advantageous position or a disadvantageous one, the opposite state should be always present to your mind. The art of war teaches us to rely on our own readiness to receive the enemy, rather than on the chance of his not attacking, but on the fact that our position is unassailable. Chang Yu, after Wang Shi, makes a different interpretation of Sun Tzu here, get the enemy into a position where he must suffer injury, and he will submit of his own accord. Bravery without forethought, as Cao Kung analyzes it, causes a man to fight blindly and desperately like a mad bull. They describe two types of cowardice, one, bravery without forethought, which causes a man to fight blindly and desperately like a mad bull, and two, recklessness, which leads to capture. But, as Sun Tzu knew, nothing is to be achieved in war unless you are willing to take risks. Two, cowardice, which leads to capture, T.S. Ao Kung defines the Chinese word translated here as cowardice, as being of the man, whom timidity prevents from advancing to seize an advantage, and Wang Shi adds, who is quick to flee at the sight of danger. Xuan Xuan's boat was made fast to the side of his war junk, so that he might escape, if necessary, at a moment's notice. Chao Ying Qi, a general of the Qin state, had a boat made fast for him on the river, in case of defeat. Sun Tzu condemns exaggerated sensitiveness to slanderous reports, the thin-skinned man who is stung by opprobrium, however undeserved, too, over solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble, three, a hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults, four, a delicacy of honor which is sensitive to shame, when an army is overthrown and its leader is slain, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Sun Tzu Sao Kung, these are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. 
Han Xin's victory over Lung Chu at the Wei River is described in the Qian Han Shu, ch. 34, Fol. 6 verso, by Li Qi An alludes to the great victory won by Han Xin over his opponent. The rest of the army, on the further bank, also scattered and fled in all directions. In crossing salt marshes, your sole concern should be to get over them quickly, without any delay. Tu Mu quotes Tai Kung as saying, An army should have a stream or a marsh on its left, and a hill or tumulus on its right. So much for campaigning in a flat country. Sao Kung, the Shi Qi, ch. One ad in it, speaks only of Huang Ti's victories over Yen Ti and Qi Yu. In the Lu Tao it is mentioned that he, fought 70 battles and pacified the empire. Nei Yao Qin asks, with some plausibility, whether there is an error in the text as nothing is known about Huang Ti having conquered four other emperors. Cao Lung's explanation is, that the Yellow Emperor was the first to institute the feudal system of vassals princes, each of whom, to the number of emperor, originally bore the title of emperor. Sun Tzu, the meaning of the Chinese in one place is, a crack or fissure, and the fact that the Chinese elsewhere in the sentence indicates something in the nature of a defile, makes me think that Sun Zeyu is here speaking of crevasses. This is so good that it could almost be included in a modern manual like General Baden Powell's, Aids to Scouting. T.S. Ao Kung explains this is, felling trees to clear a passage, and Chang Yu says, every man sends out scouts to climb high places and observe the enemy. The appearance of screens in the midst of thick grass means that the enemy wants to make us suspicious, says to you. When birds shoot up in their flight, it means that soldiers are in ambush at the spot beneath. Horses and chariots, being heavier than men, raise more dust and follow one another in the same wheel track, whereas foot soldiers would be marching in ranks. According to Chang Yu, every army on the march must have scouts some way in advance, who on sighting dust raised by the enemy, will gallop back and report it to the commander-in-chief. Chang Yu alludes to the story of Tian Tan of the Qi Mo against the Yen forces, led by Qi Chie. Tu Mu, their object is to make us contemptuous and careless, after which they will attack us. Sao Kung, to be on, desperate ground, is like sitting in a leaking boat or crouching in a burning house. Li Qing, a lofty mountain in front, a large river behind, advance impossible, retreat blocked. Then, before there is time to range our soldiers in order of battle, the enemy's overwhelming strength suddenly appears on the scene. In the Sun Tzu Hsu Lu, when the King of Wu inquires what should be done in the case of an enemy victory over his army, Sun Cao Kung says, if a position of this kind is secured first by the enemy, beware of attacking him. Li Qian and others suppose the meaning to be that the enemy has already forestalled us so that it would be sheer madness to attack. The true reading must be, not plunder, but do not plunder. Sun Tzu Sao Kung, some strategical advantage on which the enemy is depending, I should say, begin by seizing something which your opponent holds dear, then he will be amenable to your will. Tu Mu. Rapidity is the essence of war. By boldly seizing the initiative in this way, you at once throw the other side on the defensive. In 621 AD, Li Qing was sent from Kei Wei Chu in Ssu Qian to reduce the rebel Xiao Xian, who had set up as emperor at the modern Qing Chao Fu in Hupa. He embarked on his army without loss of time and was just about to start when the other generals implored him to postpone his departure until the river was in a less dangerous state for navigation. Take advantage of the enemy's unreadiness, make your way by unexpected routes, and attack unguarded spots. Carefully study the well-being of your men, pet them, humor them, give them plenty of food and drink, and look after them generally. Concentrate your energy and hoard your strength. To Mu, if all doubts and scruples are discarded, your men will never falter in their resolution until they die. Sun Tzu is slyly insinuating that, as soldiers are but human, it is for the general to see that temptations to shirk fighting and grow rich are not thrown in their way. The word in Chinese is, snivel, which is taken to indicate more genuine grief than tears alone. Not because they are afraid, but because, as Cao Kung says, all have embraced the firm resolution to do or die. The Chu was the personal name of Xuan Chu, a native of the Wu state and contemporary with Sun Tzu himself, who was employed by Kung Su Kuang, better known as Ho Lu Wang, to assassinate his sovereign Wang Liao with a dagger which he secreted in the belly of a fish served up at a banquet. Cao Kue seized Huan Kung, the Duke of Qi, as he stood on the altar steps of altar steps and held a dagger against his chest. Through this passage, the term in the Chinese has now come to be used in the sense of military maneuvers. 
Sun Tzu, is it possible to make the front and rear of an army each swiftly responsive to attack the other, just as though they were part of a single living body? Mei Yao Qin, I should answer, yes. The men of Wu and Yu are enemies, yet if they are crossing a river in the same boat and are caught by a storm, they will come to each other's assistance just as the left hand helps the right. Mei Yao Chen's paraphrase is, the way to eliminate the differences of strong and weak and to make both serviceable is to utilize accidental features of the ground. Henderson, with all respect to the textbooks, and to the ordinary tactical teaching, I am inclined to think that the study of ground is often overlooked. Sao Kung, to mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy is one of the first principles in war, as had been frequently pointed out. But how about the other process, the mystification of one's own men? Those who may think that Sun Tzu is over-emphatic on this point would do well to read Col. Henderson's remarks on Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign. In this case, we see that the Chinese general not only kept his own officers in ignorance of his real plans but actually took the bold step of dividing his army in order to deceive the enemy. Pan Chao now secretly released the prisoners whom he had taken alive, and the king of Kutcha was thus informed of his plans. Sun Tzu, on desperate ground, I would proclaim to my soldiers the hopelessness of saving their lives. Mei Yao Qin, the only chance of life lies in giving up all hope of it. The length of the chapter is disproportionate, being double that of any other except chap. X. Chap. 8 is obviously defective and probably out of place, while chap. 11 seems to contain matter that has either been added by a later hand or ought to appear elsewhere. I do not propose to draw any inferences from these facts, beyond the general conclusion that Sun Tzu's work cannot have come down to us in the shape in which it left his hands. The story runs thus in the Hao Han Shu, ch. 47, when Pan Chao arrived at Shan Shan, Quang, the king of the country, became remiss and negligent. Pan Chao then summoned a general gathering of his officers, 36 in all, and began drinking with them. For the sequel of this adventure, see Chap. 12. Pan Chao, keeping his informant carefully under lock and key, then summoned a general gathering of his officers, 36 in all, and began drinking with them. Sun Tzu might have added that there is always the risk of going wrong, either through their treachery or some misunderstanding such as Livy Records, 22. 13. Hannibal, we are told, ordered a guide to lead him into the neighborhood of Cassinum, where there was an important pass to be occupied, but his Carthaginian accent, unsuited to the pronunciation of Latin names, caused the guide to understanding Casalinum instead of Casamilius. Li Qian, if he can afford to reject entangling alliances and simply pursue his own secret designs, his prestige enables him to dispense with external friendships. Chang Yu, he does not strive to ally himself with all and sundry, nor does he foster the power of other states. He carries out his own secret designs, keeping his antagonists in awe. Chang Yu, following up on his previous note, thinks that Sun Tzu is condemning this attitude of cold-blooded selfishness and haughty isolation. Qin Hao and Chang Yu take the sentence in quite another way. Sao Kung, give instructions only on sighting the enemy. Give rewards when you see deserving deeds. Chia Lin, there should be no fixity in your rules and arrangements. Wang Shi, let advance be richly rewarded and retreat is heavily punished. Sun Tzu, when the men of Chao see me in full flight, they will abandon their fortifications and give chase. This must be the sign for you to rush in, pluck down the Chao standards, and set up the red banners of Han in their stead. In order to carry out an attack, we must have means available. Tu Mu suggests materials for making fire dry vegetable matter, reeds, brushwood, straw, grease, oil, etc., etc. Chang Yu says, vessels for hoarding fire, stuff for lighting fires. There is a proper season for making attacks with fire and special days for starting a conflagration. When the force of the flames has reached its height, follow it up with an attack, if that is practicable. If not, stay where you are. Sao Kung says, if you see a possible way, advance, but if you find the difficulties too great, retire. Sun Tzu, Po Sai, a general of the Yellow Turban Rebels, was badly defeated in 184 AD through his neglect of this simple precaution. At the head of a large army, he was besieging Changxi, which was held by Huang Fu Sung. When you make a fire, the enemy will retreat away from it. If you oppose his retreat and attack him then, he will fight desperately. Tu Mu, if the wind is in the east, begin burning to the east of the enemy, and follow up the attack yourself from that side. 
T.S. Alcung's note is, we can merely obstruct the enemy's road or divide his army, but not sweep away all his accumulated stores. The former is dismissed in a couple of sentences, Chang Yu argues, whereas the attack by fire is discussed in detail. This is one of the most perplexing passages in Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu may at times appear to be overcautious, but he never goes so far in that direction as he does in the Tao Te Ching. He says, move not unless you see an advantage, use not your troops unless there is something to be gained, fight not unless the position is critical. The Wu state was destined to be a melancholy example of this saying. When an army is deeply engaged in hostile territory, scarcity of food must be provided. As many as 700,000 families will be impeded in their labor. The allusion is to the system of dividing land into nine parts, each consisting of about 15 acres, the plot in the center being cultivated on behalf of the state by the tenants of the other eight. Sun Tzu's agreement is certainly ingenious. He argues that without spies, a war may drag on for years and that to neglect the use of spies is a crime against humanity. The idea that the true object of war is peace has its root in the national temperament of the Chinese. When these five kinds of spies are all at work, none can discover the secret system. Having local spies means employing the services of the inhabitants of a district. Tu Mu says, in the enemy's country, win people over by kind treatment, and use them as spies. Tu Mu. Inward spies should be secretly approached and bound to one's interests by means of rich presents so that they can disturb the harmony and create a breach between the sovereign and his ministers. The necessity for extreme caution, however, in dealing with inward spies, appears from a historical incident related by Ho Shi. As an example of doomed spies, Ho Shi mentions the prisoners released by Pan Chao in his campaign against Yarkand. He also refers to Tianj Chen, who in 630 AD was sent by Tai Sung to lull the Turkish Khan Chie Li into fancied security, until Li Qing was able to deliver a crushing blow against him. Ta Si Wu of the Sui dynasty was sent by Emperor Tai Su to spy upon the enemy. Tu Mu and Mei Yao Qin, with none in the whole army are more intimate relations to be maintained than with spies. Ho Shi, none should be more liberally rewarded. Shiren, when they propose anything very material, secure their persons, or have in your possession their wives and children as hostages for their fidelity. Never communicate anything to them but what is absolutely necessary that they should know. Wang Shi. In order to use them, one must know fact from falsehood, and be able to discriminate between honesty and double dealing. Mei Yao Qin. Be on your guard against the possibility of spies going over to the service of the enemy. Sun Tzu lays himself open to the charge of inhumanity, though Tu Mu tries to defend him by saying that the man deserves to be put to death, for the spy would certainly not have told the secret unless the other had been at pains to worm it out of him. Qin Hao says, if spy matters are heard before, our plans, are carried out, etc. 26. Of old, the rise of the Yin dynasty, Sun Tzu means the Shang dynasty, founded in 1766 BC, there is less precision in the Chinese than I have thought it well to introduce into my translation, and the commentaries on the passage are by no means explicit. Sun Tzu suggests that the Xia and Yin dynasties were upset owing to the intimate knowledge of their weaknesses and shortcoming which these former ministers were able to impart to the other side. Mei Yao Qin appears to resent any such aspersion on these historic names, Ai Yin and Lu Ya, he says, did not rebel against the government. Ho Shi is also indignant. How should two divinely inspired men such as Ai and Lu have acted as common spies? Yin Mu, an army without spies is like a man with ears or eyes, and the enlightened ruler and the wise general will use the highest intelligence of the army for purposes of spying and thereby they achieve great results. But this is very weak. Thanks for liking this audiobook and the summary of this audiobook. Is of spying and thereby they achieve great results. But this is very weak. Thanks for liking this audiobook and the summary of this audiobook.